are Strategic Authorpreneurs. I'm Crystal Hunt. And I'm Kelly Mitrani. We are here to help you save time, energy, money, and level up your author career. Welcome to episode number three of the Strategic Authorpreneur podcast. On today's show, we're going to take a detailed look at the writing process itself. How do you actually go about writing a book? Well, it's different for everyone and there's no right way to do it. So let's dive in and see if there's anything about our processes that could be useful to you. So what are you writing right now? Before we dive into the how, let's talk about the what. Wow, 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 wow. Okay. So uh, the answer to the question is multiple things. And um, the reason is uh, because uh, I have a different strategy writing wise uh, compare with my previous year. My previous years, uh, what I did was concentrating on one thing. One thing, make sure to finish that. You finish that story, you're done with that thing. Uh, you don't have to worry about anything else, but just go all in on that project. Completely different uh, um, uh, strategic wise uh, this year. I decided to do something that I've never done before. And uh, I would say that um, Crystal has some of the fault because she kind of pushed me in that direction to do something I've never done before. Uh, we call it credit when it's good, just for the record. <laughs> it's only fault if it's bad. And since we know this is going to have an excellent outcome, we're going to say I'm going to take some credit, not fault. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the credit uh, actually spawned uh, from an idea she had, uh, I believe, like a couple of years ago or three years ago. And very briefly, long story short, she wanted to publish 40 products um, by her 40 years uh, of age. Is that correct? Am I saying stupid yes. things? Okay. No, that's true. I only yeah. turned 40 last, last year, so okay. it wasn't we, so very long ago. Yeah. And so I was thinking like it was just still January 2020. So I was like, uh, no pressure, but I do need that year resolution. So she did that. What can I do to kind of match that uh, credit that she gave me? And I was like, okay, I'm going to write and publish 12 stories this year. So one story every single month. So what am I writing now? I'm writing four different things, uh, four different stories. Um, one is a story that is already done and is going to be published in a few days. The other one is I'm editing a story that is finished and I'm going to be publishing in March. And at the same time, you need to give us titles because otherwise we can't go and find these stories. So yeah. <laughs> you have to say the name. Okay. So mm -hmm. the, the story that I published on January is a science fiction short story called Glass into Steel. Um, in a few days, uh, I'm going to re release a dark fantasy, which is, as you can see, like a different genre, but that's another part of the, uh, of the challenge, uh, which is basically, um, um, based on the Little Red Riding Hood word, and it's goal, going to be called Not That Fairy Tale. And this time it's not going to be a short story, it's going to be a novelette. Novelettes are like stories between 7,500 to, I believe, 17,000 words. Anyways, I didn't plan it to make it uh, this long, but here we are. And the third story that's going to be published on the March is going to be called uh, the Umbrella Paradox, which is another fantasy, but it's more like on the urban fantasy side. And then I'm working on uh, different other things. Uh, but basically, that's the way I'm going to write this year. That's why the way I'm writing is so much more different and more like, I would say, over the place, because at the same time, I'm not just writing a book. I'm writing a story editing another one, publishing one as I'm like revising uh, idea and things and exploring. Uh, but what are you writing, Crystal? <laughs> well, I'm also writing a multitude of things. I have split personalities going on in that I, as Crystal Hunt, I write nonfiction. So Crystal is currently working on a couple of things. The book called Strategic Authorpreneur, which goes with all of this and is kind of an updated version of a book about self-publishing and setting yourself up for authoring and business success that I wrote the first time almost a decade ago. And a lot of it's still really interesting stuff. So I pulled it all back out 
pulled it apart, so started again, mix and matching everything up with all of my new knowledge to add to the old knowledge. And so I'm excited for that, which will be not too long probably after you're all seeing this episode. So you can go check for Strategic Authorpreneur on Amazon, see if it's out yet. And also on the fiction side, CJ, since I write fiction as CJ Hunt, CJ has been working on a combination of things because I do these novellas that are kind of all linked together in these story cycles, they're mini series. And so the mini series I'm working on right now in the Rivers and Romances is the O'Donnell family. And we had to go to Ireland and do some research in June for this one of these books. And so that was, you know, the things we do for our craft, right? So my husband and I spent a couple of weeks in Ireland where I used to live doing some research to make sure that the, the places were still somewhat as I remembered them and brushing up all of that contextual knowledge. You got to know what the food tastes like and what the people sound like. I had to get my Irish ear back. <laughs> I lived there for a couple years, but the accent and the way that the words flow, it's different. And so it was a really fun exercise to make sure my dialogue was going to be on point because some of my characters are uh, from the West Coast of Ireland. So I was, yeah, researching that. So there's one, it's called Charmed. Um, which is part of that series, but it actually shares a timeline with three other books in that series. And so I'm actually simultaneously writing Class Act, Charmed, and His and Hers. And there are three different siblings in the same family, but because what happens in one book flows into another one and they the plots all impact each other because they are happening at the same time. So I, I started and I found I couldn't just finish one then the other than the other. So I'm moving all three of the stories along kind of together and they'll all be done um, quite close together in time, I think. So yeah, just juggling three sets of plots and characters that are all interwoven has been a fun challenge for how do I track the timelines on that stuff when I make an edit in one, how, do, how does that ripple out to impact the others and they will all have to go through substantive editing at roughly the same time because if my copy editor and my developmental editor Amanda says you know I really think we need to shift this or something's got to change here it's going to ripple out to all of the books so I want to make sure that I am able to ripple that in a way that doesn't create consistency errors and that really feels authentic for the family and the characters and everything else. So, yeah. There was something you said uh, about characters and stories that like makes you think of an like of a question that it's like just going uh, immediately after. So if that's what you're working on, generally speaking, how does the idea of a story spawn? Like, uh, how do you get the idea of that book, or maybe for that character? How do you come about like, just crafting and shaping words? Um, the ideas come from really different places for me and in different formats. I have kept a, a I mean, I've had notebooks. You can see there's a whole row of solid color notebooks oh, yeah. behind me on the shelf there. I've been keeping that style for years, but since I was, I don't know, since I was 17, since the last time my computer melted down, I've been keeping story ideas in notebooks and computers and wherever. And I have kind of a central space where I was dumping all of the things that came to mind. And sometimes it'll be that I see something that sparks an idea. Sometimes I'll have like fragments of an idea or I can see a character or I can see a scene. There's one book in the River's End series that I've, I gotta work my way up to writing it because it's, it's pretty heavy. I think it'll be like, I don't know, five into uh, the Martinez family's mini series, but it's called Ruffled. They often come as titles, so that's the thing. You'll notice I have covers and titles for most of the books I plan to probably write in my life already. Um, but the picture that I have that came to mind just as I was walking one day, I just clear as day could see a picture of a firefighter kneeling in the middle of a road with a baby in his arms and just a wreck of a car on fire behind them. Um, and I can't say any more without giving away the plot 
points. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I can't yet because there I know there's there are some some folks out there who are following along and I don't want to give anything away. But um, but that's what came to me was that image to the point where I was like standing in the middle of a trail, sobbing in the middle of the forest because I could feel everything he was feeling and it was awful. And so I know how it fits and it turns out very beautifully and it's all okay in the end, but um, I'm not ready to write that yet. So there's pieces like that where all I can do is just, I, I journal the heck out of it and I record all of my thoughts that I'm having. And then I wait to see how that piece connects into the bigger fabric because I, all of the stories are in the same town. And so they're, it's just like a real small town where I come from. The people are walking around having their lives all the time. I just feel like I'm focusing in on moments of those um, and kind of pulling the stories out in those key turning point moments where our lives really change or we find that person that we love that sort of helps us be our best self or sometimes it's in this horrible moments that eventually turn into something great. So um, yeah, it is, it's very interesting and I never really know. And even the story Charmed, I had an idea for um, who the characters were going to be and how they fit together. But when we actually got to Ireland, you know, when we went out to Inishmore and we were looking at the graveyard and we were standing in a graveyard on this tiny Aran Island and it just something about the story shifted and the direction things take are very different than I intended for them to be. The book was outlined for two years before we went back to Ireland. Um, but everything changed once I was actually standing in the place uh, I needed to shift a few things. So I did. So, you know, I like to think that it's like making, you know, soup or stew. You just, you put all the stuff in the pot and then it has to, blend for a while and it you know you can eat it at uh three hours or nine hours and it's going to be good either way but it's a very different meal depending on how long you let those flavors soak in and how things connect and what you eat with it so anyway there's my metaphor for for the episode is apparently we're going soup and stew today but stew yeah stew yeah your ideas. <laughs> yeah that's interesting that's how about you idea. yeah yeah it's just because like uh, when you said like you have an idea but it seems to me like what sounds like it's like you have the idea and it's clear in your mind, but it is easy for you like uh, to change that as you need it to fit in the overall plot, which I think is something that is super important and meaningful. And I don't think it's something you can do easily if you don't have like a, a number of books that you already wrote, because like, you know, you understand right. the system, right? It's, it's something that uh, like, I don't know, a musician that plays um, the violin uh, for like 10 years uh, is going to have uh, almost no problem uh, in uh, replicating a very different, a, a very difficult music. And if you're a musician that maybe um, you are using the instrument for three months, it's going to take you much more effort to do the same song. So I think what you're hinting is super interesting because like it's something that I also kind of do, um, especially nowadays uh, when i have to write and concentrate on three to four uh, books or stories at the same time the ideas uh, that i have comes uh, i would say 60 percent from the book that i read 30 percent for things that i see or the from interaction from people so it can be like an online course or it can be any conversation with you maybe i have a book idea or maybe i have a character idea and then there is like a, a 60, 30. So there is like a 10% remain, which is basically completely random stuff. Maybe I go into the street. And uh, yeah, it was Orson Scott Card, the science fiction author that says like um, something on this line. Um, when you walk down the street, um, there are like literally thousands of stories unfolding uh, around you. If you're a good writer, you're gonna catch four or five. And so I think that's kind of meaningful because like sometimes I do have stories by maybe looking at somebody on the street or maybe at the way a conversation goes. So that's the 10% from where my ideas come from. But mainly 
I would save on things that I read because when I read, I feel way more. I feel a lot. Right. Well, I get a lot from music actually. So when I'm walking, I will be doing one of two things usually. I will usually be listening to music or audiobooks or podcast, or I will be talking on the phone with my earbuds in, the sneaky little ones yeah. here. Um, so I probably look like I'm talking to myself, uh, but I will be <laughs> chatting with other people because it's. I find it's a good way to kind of multitask. I'm getting some exercise and I'm also staying in touch with the people I care about in my life so I can double up that way. But listening to music while walking in nature is shocking how many stories there are in songs. And I, I definitely genre hop in music where I, I bounce around all over everywhere. And I love picking a song in Spotify and saying, okay, go nuts. Like, what do you want me to listen to next? I actually made a, um, I actually made a playlist on Spotify for my town and my book series. And they're all the songs that have kind of spawned stories or that I've listened to and listening to the song was like, oh, this is this book. So I have a theme song for each of my books, uh, sometimes two, depending if there's two storylines running uh, together. So that's just kind of a fun other source of inspiration. It's if you're actually listening to lyrics, they are very short, tight stories in a song and the bridge often completely changes the story that's being told in the song. So I, I love that. It's like a haiku, right? Where the last line changes the meaning of what came before it. And that's often the case in music as well. So um, how, how do you, yeah. Yeah. How, how do you capture the ideas when they come? Like when, when they fly into your brain, then what do you do with them? So you said, like you mentioned before that you use the notebook, uh, notebooks to take, uh, take notes. Um, I have to say I have my notebooks uh, and it's not here, but I, I will show you. You know what? I'm going to show it to you one second. Okay. And uh, I thought it was meaningful because like, uh, it's like uh, this kind of thing that it's kind of weird. It was like the paper is very, very thick and it's not white. Mm -hmm. It makes it so much different uh, from any, any other things. The way I touch it, I can't write a story on this kind of uh, support. And I see leather things. I don't use this stuff for writing stories, but it's small enough that I can put like uh, small things of idea, so small trickles. And there will be like date and the place where I took the, the idea. That's the main. Um, the main way I basically froze or freeze an idea, and it also encompassed compass as uh, um, as uh, the symbol. And the way and the reason why I'm so excited when I show you this is because really, these are like basically chunk of things that can mean completely nothing, or can can spawn, can become like a, a fleshed out story. It's like each and every single one of my books start from a note like this. Uh, Omni logos for the science fiction Lord of Time. I still have like the books, and I remember, <clears throat> sorry, the notebooks uh, where I put like uh, the first idea. I remember the day that idea was uh, uh, was uh, jotted down on that notebook. That's the way I basically keep track of things. Uh, after that, uh, like if if you were wondering if I put this um, on a um, like a scrivener or like uh, on a software of any kind, I don't do that because uh, what I will do is if I have an idea here and I write it uh, maybe once for once or three or four pages, I understand the idea is more than idea. So I immediately start to write a story. And so I don't need uh, to translate um, uh, the paper notes into uh, software notes as I know lots of uh, writers do because I take action almost uh, immediately, especially with short, shorter stories. When the idea is fresh for me, and I can see like there, there are several ideas on that story, on that notebook, that's for me, it's a direction to follow. It's, it, it says to me, uh, you have to write something, you start something, you write something, the first draft. It's the indicator for me that I need to write that story. It's like a critical mass, you would say, if there is a lot of stuff, a lot of ideas, I'd say three or four pages of those uh, of that notebooks are stuffed with idea about that story, I need to write it. And it doesn't matter if the first draft, it's like 
doesn't make a kind of sense. Uh, but what I'm doing at that moment is like, uh, I'm jotting down the idea and then I can edit it afterward. So that's why I, that's how now and nowadays I capture my ideas. Always in longhand, always with a pen, and always on a notebook that it's just designed for that purpose. I don't want stories on that. I just put my idea there. What do you do except for uh, like notebooks? <laughs> I do have an obsession with notebooks. Let me just pull a random one from here. Uh, let's see. So oh, most of them have sayings on them. <laughs> I, I got, these are like the series is from Indigo. So I go in when I'm ready for a new uh, one. I have this thing. Can I say, can I show it to you for a second? Yeah. So that is super weird because I use the same kind of things like the fourth and oh, thing, yeah. but uh, this one, I use them uh, for writing my stories. Like uh, in, I will write the uh, longhand version of that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly the same thing. Exactly the same. That's amazing. I know that. Um, Sorry, we're saying. Yeah. So I will randomly just jot ideas, thoughts, whatever, as they come. Trying to see. I often sketch things, which is hilarious because I'm I'm not a particularly great. Can we see some artist. of the sketches? <laughs> well, I'm trying to find some. I am not seeing pictures in this one though. I have a map. Some oh, okay. Here's one, which is not much. I was drafting up an idea for some um, oracle cards or tarot oh, cards. That's interesting. Um, that I want to make for my magic series at some point. So. I will draft up ideas like that. One time we were camping up um, in Golden Ears and we drove past what I think is like, I think there's a prison up there and there was like school buses and it, the forest fires were going on and it was so smoky and we couldn't really, we couldn't go hiking. We couldn't do most of the stuff you normally do camping and it felt very post-apocalyptic and there's no power or anything where we were. So we ended up, um, I had my notebook and I got this idea for a series of interlinked stories of different people's experiences of a really bad forest fire that comes through this public campground area. And so in River's End, there's a nearby place that's kind of like that. It's called Spirit Lake. And um, we've encountered it in a couple of books already and it will be reappearing in more. But I sat there with my notebook for most of a week and I mapped out the entire like pretend area in um in my story world and then went in there and just yeah sketched it all up and did all that stuff but but then you do have to choose like okay well now what am I going to pay attention to and how am I going to map that back into things so like you I don't take everything and write it out in a different way necessarily but I use the inspiration or the ideas from that and I will open a Scrivener document as soon as something is clear enough for me that it has a title or that it fits somewhere that I can think of then I open a Scrivener document with that title and I start dumping ideas in and I have a template that I've made um, which is a mashup of all of the structure for stories that I found the most helpful and with each craft book that I've read and really loved and found the pieces that work for my process I've created myself a Scrivener template so I can open a Scrivener file that auto populates with all of my structure notes for how I'm going to outline a romance novella particularly like I've I've really refined that one I've written I guess 13 or 14 uh romance stories now and so with each one I've refined it a little bit more and so I start with that for each of them so that I have a structure and it built in there are you know the fields I fill out for each of the characters as I get to know them and whatever else so I start with just a single notes document at the top of that that's like ideas or possibilities. And so when I first start that Scrivener document, I just start filling in that possibilities field. I don't worry about fleshing out everything yet, but I have a, a huge uh, Dropbox full of different story sparks, I call them. And then um, I'll take a spark and I'll start fleshing it out when I feel like there's enough pieces and when I can see how it connects into the bigger picture, if that makes so sense. So basically, that's basically how you pursue one idea. 
because like uh, the, the thing I was wondering is how do you decide how to marshal your resources on one idea? How do you decide, okay, now I've uh, reached that critical mass. How do you, how do, you de do you decide how, what to pursue and why? Well, when I first was starting, I just, I, I was in kind of a slump. I hadn't really been writing for a long time, you know, following the whole kids book publishing company and closing that down and then sort of digging out of debt and dealing with all of that stuff. Writing, once you become a writer and you're paid for it, um, I took a lot of writing contracts. I did a lot more children's books after we closed our company for other people. And so once it becomes your job, it changes things. And my husband and I both were like, oh, we want to we want to be writers when we grow up. And so we got to that point where we were actually making our whole living from writing things on contract for other people and whatever else. And it turned out he was like, I'm out. I don't want to do this for work. He's like, I thought I would love this. And I, I don't, you know, he's like, it's, it's very limiting to have to do things for money specifically when it's also your creative passion, it gets very complicated. And so he was like, nope, not for me. He's like, I'm going to do this as my hobby still, but I don't want to do this as a job. And for me, I need a little bit of time to like regroup and figure out what were the parts that I loved and how do I get those back? And so he said, okay, like enough already, just follow the fun, just do whatever feels like fun to you. So I said, okay, well, all right. Um, and I wasn't really sure what that was. And I was feeling, you know, kind of blocked because it had been a while and writing is a muscle. You don't use it and you've got to get back in shape before you can keep going. So I ended up um, doing nano in 2014 and I decided, okay, well, this will be part of what gets me unblocked. So I did NaNoWriMo, I had this story outlined, it was called Whistle While You Work, and I'd started it, and it was all good, I could see pieces of it, and the characters were talking to me, and I sat down in front of my computer, and I typed in Silver Bells, and then I started writing a completely different book. I, I didn't do what I intended, which any of you out there who are now laughing and nodding in agreement, yep, NaNo has that impact on people. We're talking about NaNoWriMo for those newcomers who are, it's National Novel Writing Month, where you try to write a 50,000 word novel in a month. And I had been struggling because I had so many story outlines in my folders. And like, I'm great until about 20 or 30,000 words. And then I get stuck. Mm -hmm. And so I had hundreds of books that stop at 20 or 30,000 words. And I was like, I'm never finishing anything. This is terrible. So I, you know, the counselor in me was like, okay, well, what do we do if we're not hitting an end goal? Let's look at a different end goal. Maybe we just need to shift the goalpost a little bit. So I was like, well, if I stop between 20 and 30,000 words on every book, what if my goal was to write a 20,000 word story? <laughs> what about then? So I just started writing and that's what happened. I ended up with a novella and then people downloaded it. And then I ended up with another one in the same series. And then I started sort of testing out different series or different characters to see what people would respond to and what I was having fun writing. And so I ended up and like, don't do this. This is not <laughs> a good way to do this. But I ended up writing basically five book ones. Um, so I have like five mini series that are set in River's End. And the first thing I did was write book one in each of those because the timelines are interwoven and I wasn't sure which ones I would really get into. And I was still just trying to follow the fun to sort of refine my writing voice. And so um, not the best strategically uh, because when I finally, I'd written all those book ones and I just had a lot of angry readers who were like, yeah, but when are you going to write book two in this one? I don't want to meet new people. I want more stories from the old people. So I went back and I finished the next few in a row in the McAllister family. So the ones that follow Silver Bells. And I, I kind of closed out that story arc and gave them the happily ever after they were looking for in the big wedding and the whole bit. Um, so that story arc was kind of closed. And so now I, I've moved back to the other ones where I have book one. So, you know, I know that the vision I have in my head is going to take five to 10 years to execute even the basic uh, storylines and story sets that I have 
already outlined and envisioned and I have covers for and all of those things. So it, it is an interesting extra exercise. So at first it was just pursue whatever was fun, but then once it did become a business, then I looked at, okay, well, strategically, like, yes, it's fun and exciting to work on something new and shiny, but also I need to finish the next books in my series. And so as I have been developing the process, I've been choosing which projects um, to keep going with and basically looking for reader reaction. You know, if the readers are emailing me constantly, like, when am I going to get so-and-so story? Then I'm more likely to prioritize that because I know that there's an audience already waiting for it. And so that, I mean, as a writer, that does add to the fun. If you know that people are excited about reading the next one and you're getting emails, but what happens? You got to tell me. Then it does make it a lot easier to kind of prioritize that thing because yeah, financially, you know, there's an audience and creatively, it's just fun to have somebody else playing with your imaginary friends too, right? <laughs> You've got company in there. So yeah, that's really cool. Um, what does your process look like in terms of what are the actual phases of writing that you go through? Is it the same each of these stories? Or are you finding it's really different as you're evolving? What's going on there? Now, as I was mentioning, I'm, I'm starting and trying different things. Now, this one story per month thing, which is my challenge for 2020, completely, completely uh, changed my writing style, the way <clears throat> I'm approaching to a new project. I found, though, I need to say, tell you this, Crystal. Um, I put a lot of pressure off my shoulders by deciding that no matter what, I needed to uh, publish a story. And you know very well that this time I put a uh, uh, penalty if I didn't do so, which keeps me more accountable. Uh, so I pledge like to, to pay a certain amount of money each month if I don't publish that story. Um, and this changed completely my writing process from this year to the previous year. The previous years, uh, the process of deciding and pursuing and uh, deciding which are the steps to take to writing this story or project where, okay, I need to write this thing. Uh, it's big because I usually like wrote something on the 50,000 words or more. I wrote words, um, I wrote uh, uh, books that were like uh, were 150,000 words in Italian, of course. Um, and the moment I started and I decided to write in English, that became even more difficult because English is not my first language. So I was adding so much pressure on me to write as I was writing in Italian, right? It's completely yeah. stupid. It was a stupid decision which didn't work in English. How... Uh, it worked in Italian because that was mother tongue. I would write like 200,000 uh, uh, words, uh, uh, novels in one year, maybe in, uh, uh, even less than that. So I had to rethink everything. The way I'm writing now, it's completely different from what I was doing in the past. So since I have to write short stories, novelette or novella on a monthly basis, all that pressure of the length is off my shoulders which is super, hyper important. And you, Crystal, mentioned that the moment you realize that your sweet spot was 20,000, 30,000, that changed everything. It re literally revolutionized the way you are writing and crafting stories. And now you're rocking it, right? Now, I, I had this uh, similar uh, realization. Uh, my skills as a storyteller and as a writer in English, are nowhere close to where I want to be. I cannot write a full-length novel without in, uh, using an asset of uh, uh, resources, energy, and money and time that I simply don't have. Um, and I know this for a fact because writing Lord of Time, which is a 47,000 words uh, uh, dark fantasy novel, took two years. That's not sustainable. I just can't do that. And it was difficult to say no to that because it meant like, you, it's like you failed. It's like you can't do that anymore. You can't allow yourself to do that. So I was forced, as you were forced, to rethink everything. And now what I'm finding, similar to what you found for yourself, is I'm listening to the thing I can't, can do. So I know I can write a short story that is maybe 5,000 words long in like five days. So I'll do that. 
I'll keep all the pressure out. I just focus on writing that story and the steps are the following. If I have ideas over a word or over a scene, they are very, very insistent. They are very pressing me. I will write them in this guy over here. If those ideas hit the critical mass, let's say two to three pages are filled with ideas about that word, I need to write a story about that idea, ideas on this book, this format book. And this is basically the way I have been writing stories since uh, the beginning of this year. And this is the way I am consistently producing and shipping stories. Now the second story is gonna be uh, uh, published in uh, like, uh, now it's the 27th of uh, uh, February in a couple of days. I know that's gonna happen because it's already done. And I would never have thought this possible without rethinking completely the way I was writing stories. So that's my step by step way I do things. You kind of hinted at yours, but I want to know a bit more if possible about like how do you go from like that title thing, which is for me was amazing to listen because the title is the most difficult thing for me. I can't figure out the title. Like I, I don't know which, which is the title of my story in the very end until usually the end. How do you come up with that? How do you understand like that's my first step, that's my second step? And most of all, how do you get to know the title as one of the first things? Um, I, think, I think it's because I don't think the stories, I feel the stories. Like it's, it's often, um, I don't know how to really explain this, but it's like I get a, I can feel the whole thing in emotions. I'm a, I'm a psychologist by background, so that's maybe part of it. Maybe it's some sort of, I don't know, woo kind of nonsense. I have no idea, but um, I, I can feel what it wants to be, which sounds totally flaky. And I'm normally so like strategic and business-like, but we're talking to CJ here, not just Crystal. So CJ is a little more open to whatever's going on out there in the universe. Um, sometimes it is that I'll see an image. I do a lot of the cover design myself, and then I just sort of bring in a graphic designer as I need to for pieces. And so I spend a lot of time searching stock image databases. Sometimes it is I'll hear a song and a phrase or something will pop into my head. Um, often there's a certain amount of irony or, or like, uh, the source of conflict maybe is woven into the title. There's like an essence. So there's this, this idea I went to as part of my got to get back into writing thing. I went to a happiness retreat in Mexico that was run by a lady called Laura Levine. And I was in a pretty low spot. Nothing was going very well. I applied for a scholarship to, to go. A former student had offered to pay someone else's tuition because their life had changed so much for the better from attending this. And so this email came out. I didn't get a big work contract I had applied for. Like I found out hours before this email about a scholarship came out and they would have been at exactly the same time. So it was an interesting twist of fate or serendipity or whatever, but this email landed in my box. I applied, I went to the retreat and it was a very interesting experience. But one of the things that Laura taught us all about was this idea of essence versus form that you have an essence to something. So our essence for our podcast might be connection and sharing and generosity and fun and playfulness, whatever. Those could all be essences. The form is a podcast, right? But our experiences are more than just the form they take. And so thinking about writing as that, um, often, the, it'll be the essence of a story that comes to me. So we would call that theme in the writing world, right? It's a theme. But I always really had trouble when they were saying in, you know, in school, I did a lot of university around stories and it was like, what's the theme of this piece? And it was like, ugh, I don't know. But, but what does this piece feel like? Okay, that I can do. So it's just a different way of looking at it. But I think for me, if I know the central thread that's going to tie that story together like what is at the center of all of that um then i can kind of ripple that out into the story itself so it is often 
a single scene I see in my mind or a character or a snippet of dialogue. Like sometimes I will actually hear the characters talking and that's usually what that title is drawn from. They're almost all single words. Some of them are two, but they're almost all single word titles. Um, so it, it's just that that focus on distilling something down to its essence before you can expand out. Like you have to know where you're going well, and not everybody does. So let me rephrase that. I have to know where I'm going in order yeah. to get there. Like I need to know the essence of the story I'm trying to tell because everything else I say and the way I say it is going to be impacted by what I'm trying to communicate with that thing. And because my story world, and I'm going to like do hand yeah. gestures for those of you listening right now, my story world is really in 3D in my head. It's not that one book is linearly connected to another book which is connected to another book, it's a 3D map in my head of different nodes. Like when you look at a graphic of a network, you know, it's, it's all of these pieces that are interconnected in, in 3D. So that, that maps out to the titles. And if I can see the titles and I can see how those essences connect from one to the next or how that might transform or how they might interact with each other, then that's what might make sense for me, which is, probably more complicated than most folks needed to be. But, um, but once I figured out the title and the cover, then I can write the story. But I, I can't seem to get, past, if I don't have a title and a cover, it's not ready yet. Mm -hmm. So then I will go and like I said earlier, I'll meet the characters, which means you can see some of the books on the shelf behind me, but um, the Emotional Thesaurus by, or the Emotional Wound Thesaurus by Angela Ackerman and Becca Puglisi is one of my favorite resources. So once I feel like I have a sense of who the characters are. And in most romances, there's, there's two primary characters, right? So once I know who those two characters are, I will go and map them. And what happens is I have to be able to place them. You can see these are tabs with names. Mm. These are all the characters in the, the written books um, mm. because that's my next step is once I have a rough sense of who they are, I will go into this book and I will find their emotional wound, right? The hole in their soul, because that's what the arc of the story is gonna be about. And that's gonna be the source of the conflict in the books and the source of the happy ending as well. And it really is about getting that partnership right because it's a romance. You need both of those characters to be going to push each other's buttons and challenge each other and also in the end be good for each other and so figuring those things out with my psychologist hat on is sort of the next piece for me i can't go any further if i don't understand those people because i do plot but i don't plot everything i'm a very high level plotter in that i will know the characters inside and out um in the important pieces anyway, the big structural details. And then I'm actually what people call a discovery writer. So I don't plot all the little details. I will sit down and just start writing and get in the flow and, and the details all come. And often characters will show up who I wasn't really expecting, but they connect into another story I've sort of had at the back of my mind. And um, the pieces sort of start to fall into place, but only once I hit that flow state where I'm in it enough to be just writing and not holding anything back. I just have to like open up the valve on my brain and let all the words pour out. And that's when I find out the really interesting stuff and um, some of those connections are made. So yeah. that's the, the actual writing process is I, I spend most of the time actually getting familiar with the world and how it's going to fit. The actual writing, I write very fast. Like I, I think my biggest writing day was 13,000 words in a single day which was like 6 a.m. till midnight. Perfect. Let's not kid ourselves. It was all of the hours in the day. But, <laughs> um, but I, do, I do write quickly only because I need to know well enough the people who are acting in the story to know what they would do next and to feel comfortable sort of inserting words into their mouths and people into their lives and all of those things. So yeah, once I'm, I'm comfortable enough and things have settled enough, then I dive into the actual writing. So that's why I usually have so many stories in the development phase at the same time is because it takes a long time to, to know all of how they fit before I can actually sit down and put the words on the page. That to me is the smallest piece of the storytelling, actually. It's the most important because nobody else can read it while it's only in my head, but it is the least 
big piece from a creator's perspective. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, you mentioned all these things and all thought. Uh, there are basically mapping things. Uh, the, what's involved, Quindi, you said like the step-by-step, -step, uh, mm -hmm. what's your process like, uh, why you said this works for you, and what's the difference between you and me, but what can be for other people. But like, there is a question that is like almost called by all of this. This is how it works for you, but like, there are things that maybe in your uh, career as an author, like you tried, maybe really hard because it maybe they were working for somebody else but they didn't work and if you had tried some of these uh, what kind of things were were they were they resources were there suggestions from other writers uh, like something that you maybe can say that was one of the tool tools in the toolbox uh, that didn't work for me yeah, there's a lot of tools in the toolbox that haven't worked for me, to be honest. I am a big one for trying everything that people say works for them. I test everything I hear people talk about that might be an improvement on my current process. I will try it and then analyze it. So I have this um, acronym that if, if you've read Strategic Series Author, which is my book on writing series for writers, it's there's a whole section on talking about being a careful author, K-A-R-E. And so my thought is you gather knowledge, then you take action, then you reflect on that, and then you evolve your process, right? So for me, that's what I do with every book, every story, every time I do the same piece of a, the process again, I will do that. I will learn everything I can about what's changed since last time I did it. I will analyze the experts who are doing it and then go forward. So the stuff I have discarded in my evolution, um, I have discarded the idea that you have to write every day because I don't do that. I, I shouldn't say that. I do write every day, but I don't work on a fiction book every day. Small amounts spread over time is not how I am effective. For me to really get into that story where the to the point where I can hit my flow state, I need a clear block of time and I need to drop into it and I need to not come back out again until that story is done. Which is partly why it's really good for me to have shorter stories because if I was doing that <laughs> with a fulling the novel, I think my family and friends would not be thrilled with me and I would probably, I would forget to eat. I would probably not shower. Like it would just get <laughs> ugly. My husband might be real sad about all of that. So, um, so mostly I, I do things in chunks. It's just like everything else. I block off time and then I will do a deep dive. So if I have blocked off, you know, a week of writing time, then in the weeks building up to that, I will make sure that I'm doing all of the story development stuff and I'm deep in figuring out those characters and, and, you know, well, basically we're dating. I'm dating that story and we are getting to know each other and seeing how things feel and what we like and don't like and what's going to work not work and we are negotiating our story relationship and then um when it comes to writing time that to me is like that's the honeymoon basically <laughs> that's like okay off we go we have a, a vacation week booked and we're gonna do this thing so that that i would say is is kind of what that process is like and i have thrown out the putting pressure on myself to be like anyone else because i've tried to write longer i just did try to write longer again because i thought okay i've been writing novellas now for a couple of years surely i'm ready to write a longer book can you guess what happened <laughs> i have four books mm -hmm. at thirty thousand words right now <laughs> which are not done so i just need to reset that again so yeah, that's what doesn't work. Another thing that doesn't really work for me is um, bouncing in and out of being a creative. So I find the switching back and forth and that pulling between my, my other work and my writing work to be very difficult to navigate. And the closer you get to being able to go full time with your writing, I think the harder it is 
to be pulled back and forth. And so for me, the thing that doesn't work anymore is dividing my focus. And I think actually when this podcast episode goes live, we'll be in day two or three of my official full-time writing career because I, I did make the decision um, a few months ago, actually, that I would phase out my consulting company and I would go full time to creative work, which is including teaching in the podcast and some things like that, because that those are all things that I love, but that I would no longer do corporate work or do client based work for other people's projects. I was going to actually do my own creative stuff. So um, it'll be interesting to see what does or doesn't work in that new context, because most of what I developed as far as my systems and processes were all built to support me staying in the job that was making enough money to pay the bills and to put the money aside for the writing. But now I have a little stash. I'm like a squirrel. I stashed <laughs> away my royalties from the last few months so that I would have those to reinvest in my writing business. And, um, and I have the time as well and the freedom to be able to make that decision to leap. So I don't know what's going to work or not work for, for new crystal. So you'll have to ask me that again in a few months. Um, how about you? What are some things you have found did not work for you? That's interesting that you were mentioning the potters and the panther kind of thing. Uh, I'll tell you one thing that didn't work for me at all. Uh, although I really wanted it to work. Like I, I wanted it very bad, which was like uh, learning how to like sit, plot all the novel, like a plotter, and then just write the story. And I'll tell you more, I took actions in order for me to become a plotter. I bought books, like for example, The Plot Whisperer, uh, Save the Cat, write, uh, Writes the Novel, amazing books, great books, um, very interesting uh, books. Um, lots of the interesting things are explained and said in those books and other books uh, that uh, advocate the importance, of course, of the plot and the pacing and the way the plot is structured. I tried it really hard for months. And for months, I couldn't come up with a story, zero. It was like a dry desert. And I remember the, the, the moment that was a dry desert, it was like from the moment I published The Lord of Time until basically a couple of months ago. Um, well, I would say, yeah, a couple of months ago when I decided to do this yearly challenge. So I wanted to be a plotter. And I wanted to learn how to be a plotter. And I found out uh, that I couldn't. And that made me sad, very much sad, because I was like, but if I become, become a plotter, it's going to be, be so much easier to write like a 100,000 bo words book. Like it's going to be easy and it's going to be actionable. And I will be able to do that maybe two or three books per year. The problem is this, Krista, and all the people that are listening to us is that I simply was not that kind of writer. And maybe it's something that is just at this stage of my writing career. Maybe it's stuff that I didn't master. But if there is one thing that you maybe should take away from you, it's like, uh, if you're not that kind of person, if you're not that kind of writer, you can't push yourself into being that uh, in a few months or in a few weeks. The mistake I made was that uh, look at other authors and I said, it's working for them why mm -hmm. it's not working for me. I reshifted everything in 2020. I was like, I'm going to use the 80%, 20% Pareto principles. I know I can write a short story in a week. Why don't I write a short story in a week? Just do it. You did that in the past. You can replicate the process. And so I did that. I put all those interesting books aside. I learned from them because I learned stuff like about uh, pension pacing and the importance of the want and the need and the wound uh, of a character. I took everything that I knew that I knew was going to help me in this other project and I reshaped it based on the person and the writer that I am. And now I'm right as I wasn't writing uh, before because I'm using what I know and I'm using what I understand of my writing style into starting the project, finishing the project and shipping it, which is something I absolutely wasn't doing because of the simple mistake, because of him or her is doing that, I should be able to do that. 
So that's basically what I've learned. And I hope it's not a mistake I'm going to make. Know <laughs> th thyself as a writer. Use that as a resources. And don't ever compare your starting point to someone else's middle or someone else like finishing. That's it's something I, I can't stress enough. Like I completely and utterly can't stress enough this thing. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. Yeah, for sure. It is really easy. I mean, now with the, with the access of, of um, podcasts and stuff, you can hear all about people that you normally would never come into contact with. So I know, you know, for me, you meet so many people who are writers now. I didn't know anyone who was a writer when I was young. I didn't meet my first person who was a writer until I was in college. And, um, and now we get to meet a lot of really cool people speaking at conferences and traveling around and being on podcasts and having people on podcasts and all of these things means you have some conversations with some folks who are rocking it, which is amazing. Yeah. But if all you listen to are stories and advice from people who are 15 years into their writing career, yeah. you know, that's very different than, than that's not your next step. Their next step and their process is going to involve tools and paid services and so many books worth of experience. You don't need, you don't need to swim in that pool. You don't need to play that game. And they didn't get there by doing that. That is what they do now. No. So I think it's so important to remember also that what worked for someone else, it was a different time. They were different people than you. Their stories were different stories. Their readers are different readers. There may be some overlap, but it's not going to be all. And so it really is figuring out what's going to be fun for you, because if you don't love it, you're not going to do it over time. And I have to say, I have listened to thousands, like actually thousands of podcasts and interviews with various authors. I've read books. I've listened to conference talks and workshops over the past 20 years. And there is only one consistent thread through, okay, two, Put your butt in the chair and write the words. You cannot get anywhere if you don't do that. And the second thing is do it for a long time. <laughs> like, you have to be so stubborn that you don't give up until you hit that tipping point. I remember a professor in uh, university talking about the 1% the thing where there's like only 1% of people don't give up when they're trying to do a thing. I have no idea where this research came from. They may have just pulled the number out of thin air. I don't know. And I actually don't care. But his point was just by showing up, you are already 99% ahead of everybody else. And you keep that advantage until the day you choose not to show up. And so the only way to confirm that you will not be successful in this business is to not show up. Everything else is success. It's just happening more or less slowly, depending on where you're at in the track. And I can say from experience that if you stick with it a little while, what you'll find is that in the beginning, it's like you're just starting to roll this giant boulder <laughs> up a mountain and it's really heavy and no one is helping you. And everybody's like, what's that idiot doing over there? Why is he pushing that rock towards the mountain? That looks really hard. That's gonna suck. What if you get crushed, right? pretty much what we face when we're telling people I'm going to be a writer when I grow up and they're all like, ah, oh, okay, nice. Yeah. Good luck with that. Be pretty heavy and hard and you might get crushed and someone's going to give you a bad review. There's all these bad, hard things, right? But you get stronger as you keep pushing and people join you eventually. They're like, oh, they're not giving up. Okay. Maybe I'll lend a hand for a little while. And so you accumulate people who are supporting you. The rock starts to feel a little lighter because you're getting stronger as you push it. You get better at learning about angles and leverage and tools you can use to help you roll the rock, like all of the things, right? So the only way to ensure you're going to make it up that mountain is by not quitting. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's definitely important. And then there is another thing. Um, this one is more on the uh, story side, uh, side because I'm uh, on the process of studying from uh, writers that uh, really are changing the world uh, with their stories. And that's one of the reasons, I don't know if I mentioned that before, that about Masterclass is because like it's giving me access to idea at Crystal. Like they are like 
I don't have a word. I don't know the English word for it because it's more than awesome. I don't know if there's something more than that, but you literally get inside the head of Neil Gaiman, Dan Brown, Margaret Atwood. There's one thing that Margaret Atwood said, and this is uh, on the trailer of the masterclass, and she said something very close to what she said. She was like, every year, uh, come up with a new theory on the novel. There's just one theory of the novel. And she just go in and say, hold my attention. And she does that in the way that she, you know, can convey things. And basically that's there is on writing a story. It's like making the person on the other side interested in what you're writing. And I think this boils down to all that we have discussed in today's episode, pacing, uh, it boils down on uh, the way we craft our own ideas on what works and what doesn't. And those hold my attention. These, these three words, if you understand, if you understand like the truth behind them, I think you are on the 99% of that 1% that is going to make it uh, like big because it's really, it boils down to that. It's like knowing, you, knowing yourself, know your strength, know what you can do good double down on that and keep readers attention up that's i think <laughs> like it's basically in a nutshell what we're saying like it's like really showing up and be consistent about that and the only way you'll be able to do that is by holding people attention over and over and over and over and I think by holding your own attention, like yeah. it, you have to be passionate and excited about what you're writing, because if you're not, that communicates itself through the pages, through the words, you can, you can feel it. If an author is like clearly signed a contract to write the next book, but they really don't want to like that <laughs> comes through, right? You yeah. they, the story falls a little flat. You're like, huh? Okay. <laughs> Um, and it's interesting to bounce around to different books at different points of people's careers, or, you know, you hear the backstory behind some of these things where it's like, well, you know, I didn't really want to write that last one, but the previous <laughs> ones in the series did so well and needed a new roof or whatever. Like it's when it boils down into just the business side and the passion part is gone and the fun and excitement is all gone, then it, it is hard to keep that momentum going. So you got to keep things fresh and in the interest of keeping things fresh, we are going to dig around in the curious jar and <laughs> see what question we are keeping things fresh with. So, usual procedure, you tell me yes. when to stop. Okay, yeah, now. Oh, oh, two, no. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Well, that's a light green. Is that a light green? It's a green one. I'm sweating. <laughs> Uh, you should be. Okay. What is one story that scared the living heck out of you since we're going okay. PG for this episode? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I what is the one story? Okay. Okay. I can think of one and this is by Neil Gaiman and uh, it was out of one of his anthologies. I think it was like out of uh, fragile things, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, uh, small spoiler, super short story, but at the same time, freaked the heck out of me. Like, do you say that kind of thing? Like, it scared me a lot. Mm -hmm. And if I have to just summarize the idea, which was I thought like brilliant, um, but at the same time very simple. He made it in like, I think in a few pages. So, again, spoiler alert. But if you're not gonna read that. It's basically start with a person going to hell. And uh, he find himself inside a room with a demon. There is nobody else but the demon and the human being. And the demon start torture him. And he start torture him in a like very um, effective ways, like both uh, mentally and psychologically and physically. And he does that uh, on, uh, it seems like an eternity. At the end, the demons go away from the room and the human beings, which has been brutalized for an age, probably, uh, both like physically and mentally, find himself, himself in this room, the doors open and another human being comes 
and he understands he's going to be the next demon that is going to torture to hell this person. And I found it like so powerful and so meaningful because it's like, that is a hack of things you can convey just in one short story. And at the same time, it's something that I always remember because it's like a, a person can shape and change you that much that you can fundamentally change the way you act or change the way you, uh, you feel and live lives. This person was a decent person before, but uh, because of all the things that the demon did to him, uh, he turned out to be a demon himself and he's going to do the same to the next person. So I felt like it's, it's also, I love it because it's like a story that goes full circle. You can literally start the story from the end of that story, like a new story. So I always found it like fascinating, scary at the same time. <laughs> nice. I went through a phase. I think when I was 11, I picked the Tommy knockers off of my mom's bookshelf and I don't know how it got there in the first place I can't imagine her ever reading that but somebody must have given it to us and it was on the shelf so it was Stephen King um yeah <laughs> I, I read that I don't remember all the details I remember being terrified yeah I I had the lights on a lot at night and I could not walk past we owned a hotel and campground at that point and the office was on one end of the seven acre property and the house we lived in was on the other end of the seven acre property and if I had to walk in the dark there was a bunch of like really tall hedges and like different buildings and this old tree in the middle of a bunch of cabins that we called the haunted tree because somebody had nailed shoes up oh. the trunk so there was like shoot and there are all these gnarled like crab apple -y kind of trees they were creepy covered in <laughs> cobwebs the whole deal it was like I could not walk alone. I couldn't walk. I had to run full speed as fast as I possibly could, mostly trying not to breathe or look at anything and definitely not stopping for anything, no matter what I heard or saw. So the Tommy knockers was a large part of that for me. Um, yeah. And then I read nothing but horror for like three years. <laughs> uh, and like sci-fi kind of suspensey stuff the darker the better uh yeah so that was a phase that's interesting so there uh -huh. was a darker side of you before the roman side of you oh yes mm. yes uh that's it's she's still in there that darker me um i have a series one of the mini series in river's end is called the touch of magic and so it it's a little bit of magic but also a little bit of dark stuff and it blends over with uh, some security romantic suspense kind of stuff and so um the dark my fascination with serial killers and crime uh investigation stuff i took a lot of criminology courses in my psych degree and i was fascinated by like forensics and yeah i could not get enough of bones or csi or whatever so all of those things are going to resurface at some point. That's why I made a really big world to play in so that I can write all kinds of things with all kinds of characters. But I, uh, you know, keep the, keep the dark a little bit leashed um, for the most part. At least there's a guarantee of a happy ending in the romance, right? <laughs> Let me know when you start unleashing the dark. Okay, yeah, I'll keep you posted. <laughs> All right. So for watchers out there, listeners out there, depending on whether you're watching the YouTube channel or whether you're listening to us on your favorite podcasting spot, we would like to hear what you answer to the curious jar question. So what is a story that scared the living heck out of you? And um, tell us a bit about that and maybe a bit about where you were at in your life and why it was so scary. And if you want to send us a Curious Jar question, you can email ideas at strategicauthorpreneur.com and we'll add it to the mix. You can find links to the resources we mentioned, show notes, coupons and discounts to tools, all the good things at strategicauthorpreneur.com. And you can also subscribe to the newsletter. And each week we'll email you just one thing that we think will help you on your authorpreneur journey and a link to our latest episode. And you'll get a gold star and a million bonus point in the game of life if you leave a review for us 
whether you listen to this podcast. We are a shiny, shiny new podcast. So we do need those feedback from you. We need these, those stars. Just keep them flowing. Thanks so much for taking time out of your busy life to get to know us and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on our next episode. We are going to take a deep dive into what happens when you finish drafting the story. So we're going to talk a little bit about editing and revisions, every author's favorite subject we know. Uh, but we do have some good tips and strategies to share with you and we'll hopefully connect you up as well with some great people who can help out if you're looking for communities. We'll talk a little bit about feedback and critiquing and beta readers and arc readers and all of those good things. Um, so how do you get your work perfectly polished and ready for market? So we will see you in the next episode. And until then, take care. Following them at the same time. Yep, marshing them, mashing them, marshmallowing them, marshalling <laughs> them, all of the things. You are on a strategic phase now. You are considering carefully your ideas, like a general consider his troops before the invasion of a city. Yeah. Makes sense. Yep. That's definitely what I'm doing. <laughs> I don't know, use something colorful. Like, I, I just think of like armies and uh, enemies and stuff and laws yep. and things. You think of something more <laughs> romance on the Roman side. I don't know. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Okay, so I have my magic ring. Magic ring? Yes, the man who made it was a Persian historian and he told me it would protect me from stuff. And I said, from what stuff? And he said, everything. And I was like, sign me up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he was a jewelry maker. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, I think he was actually like a wizard in disguise because we were wandering through the key in the West. I'd never been there before. And he had never, I'd never, well, I'd been there lots. I'd never seen him there before. Yeah. Just that one day. And then... I ended up buying this ring and I never saw him again. <laughs> so I think if we're in a fairy tale, he is a magic being and this is my ring of protection and that is awesome. So Gandalf's brother is right there. Right? I know, it was amazing. Um, okay, so on that note, <laughs> welcome to episode number three of the Shashti... Which is a lie. I forgot to update that part of the document. Oh, okay. So okay. Um, I'll, I'll, here, I'll, re that. I'll redo that one. Um, okay. <laughs> oh, you guys are still here? Don't you have work to do? Go, go, finish writing your next book.